But you know what? This is a brand new year. And we need to we need to really be looking forward because we're going to we, we I need my faith every day, but we're really going to need our faith in Jesus uh in the coming times. And I'm glad we have a church to come to, even if it is a gymnasium. That's all right with me. I like it. And I don't know how long it'll be till we're back in the other, but that doesn't matter. We're going to keep winning people to Jesus. And Donna, that was phenomenal singing a while ago. I tell you, that was awesome. This morning I want to do something a little bit different I don't think I've ever done before. I want to do a quick survey of parables that Jesus told, not all of them. I promise I'm not going to preach every one of them today. Can I get an amen? But uh, I think that the Lord, I know that the Lord was giving us kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, description of what was going to happen someday. I think someday is today. I believe that we're living in the time where we're, in, we're beginning the beginning of sorrows that Jesus talked about. And it hasn't gotten bad yet. Uh, COVID has been bad. It's hurt a lot of people, killed a lot of people. But just think, it's only 1% death rate. Uh, we haven't seen anything yet. But I like the parables of Jesus because they're full of hope and comfort. Not looking down and and in despair or dread, but because they're full of hope and comfort. No matter how bad it got in the stories Jesus told, there was always a way out. There was always hope. There was always deliverance, healing, and salvation. And this is where we stand in life. This is what makes it different for us. Uh, we're not exempt from catching uh, a disease. We're not exempt from if the stock market, market bottomed out, I mean, it would hurt us all. You know, we're not exempt from the things of the world as they go up and down, good and bad. The, I like that song we used to sing, Karen Peck wrote, so, sang it. It's a bend in the river of life, you know. I mean, there's going to be bends in the river. And the good news is that river that we're in leads to heaven because we're going with Jesus Christ. We're not going with the flow, we're going with the Father. And he's leading us to eternal life. And so, uh, you know, when you, in the grand scheme of things, eternal life, it's settled for us. All these other things are just bumps in the road, bends in the river, chug holes, and we've got a few big ones in Pontotoc County now. I hit one today I thought I might never get out of. And uh, we're, you know, the saying is, well, if you haven't been through it, then you're still in it. The fact of the matter is, we're all going to go through things, and some of it is really tragic. But God is there, no matter how big or small the challenges, no matter how big or small the problems we face. He's there with us on our deathbed. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. And even if... Our life is taken in a twinkling of an eye. We will wake up in heaven, and he'll say, come on in. You're right here in my book. And this is the peace that we have that other people don't have. We wish they did. We want everyone to have that peace in their heart. But, you know, it's a lot easier to lay your head on your pillow at night when you know where you're going should you not wake up. And there's a so many parables that Jesus told, and I want to skim through a few of them in the book of Matthew. Uh, first was the parable of the rich young ruler. Now, in the rich young ruler, he said there was a, a man that laid at the gate, and his name was Lazarus. And so, all the other parables... He never told the man's name or the woman's name. He would say there was a certain man or a certain woman. But in the parable of the, of the uh, rich young ruler, he, he tells, there's two times he talks about it. 
One time he talks about the rich young ruler. He does not name his name. But he says he had so much that he was saddened and he went away without accepting Jesus Christ. Now, if it look, look down in verse 21, we're not going to read all of them. We're just touching the high points. He said, if you will, if you want to be perfect, in other words, if you, Jesus said, if you want to be sinless or perfect, then go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. And the Bible says that he did not do that. He says that he went away sad. In fact, it says in verse 23, Verily I say unto you, a rich man, uh, it's hard for him to enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, it is, he says, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, they say the needle was a small gate where the camel had to get down and kind of crawl through to keep them from stampeding out of the corral. And they were trained to do that. And it wasn't impossible. It was just a, a struggle. And this is nothing against being rich. Not at all. This is against someone who puts their faith in wealth rather than God. Have you ever known, you don't have to, you know, call out any names, but have you ever known anybody that they were just so dedicated to serving the Lord and so dedicated to the Lord, but when they finally prospered and the Lord gave them wealth, they forgot about God. I've seen it happen so many times, so many times. Well, Brother Randall, if, if God would just prosper my business, I would just pay this church off. Or Brother Randall, if God would just, you know, if he would just give me what I, I want so bad, I would just pay for all the mission trips or uh, pay for all the feeding or whatever, you know. And then they get really, they begin to build wealth and we never see them again. And it happens so often. And this is why he's saying it's hard. He didn't say it's impossible. He said it's hard because uh, when we get to feeling really independent, then we become less dependent on God. If you want to be close to God, you must be dependent on God, no matter how prosperous you become. And so later then he told the story of the rich young ruler that Lazarus laid at his gate. And this time, he named a name. Daddy always said, and I believe it, he said, I think this was an absolute true story happened just like he said because he named somebody's name. All the other parables, he just said, a certain ruler or a certain man. Lazarus was sick. You see, we're not exempt from getting sick. Uh, I'm a little bit perturbed with some of these uh, doctrines being taught now that says you're sick because you don't have enough faith. I have a problem with that. In fact, I denounce that as heresy. People get sick. Human beings get sick. Church-going people get sick. People full of faith get sick. It happens, all right? Preachers that love the Lord, that little lady that all she does is love Jesus, she might get sick. Uh, it is uh, not true. There's never in the Bible anywhere does it say that if you have enough faith, you will never get sick. And, you know, I've known people that have, they've really become disillusioned with preaching in church because they've been told that there's the reason they have their infirmity is because they don't have enough faith. Well, I'm telling you, that is a lie. We don't know the answer. We don't know the answer. Sometimes God heals miraculously in ways we cannot even explain. It has to be God. I mean, there's people who have tumors, and the next day they don't. There's people that have disease, and the next day it's gone. Uh, and, you know, it just happens. And it is God that's doing it. Why does he do it for everybody? One of these days when we get to heaven, I think that we'll get the big picture. But right now, our job is to pray for people and to believe that our God is able. You know, that's what got the Hebrew children out of the fiery furnace. Our God is able. But what else did they say? Even if he does not deliver us, we will not worship another God. 
Now, that's faith. And so, the parables of Jesus are teaching us how to live in the times we're facing now and the times that are coming that are much, much worse than, than what we're facing now. Does, do you realize how fragile the United States economy is and the value of the dollar is right now? Uh, do you ever, maybe you, don't, maybe you have, maybe you haven't bought uh, like Bitcoin or doggy coin, I think it's doge or whatever. Anyway, have you ever bought in that? And it just like, oh, man, this is awesome. Next day it's, <clears throat> you know, the next day it's back out of there. I mean, it's just that's kind of how the U.S. economy, our economy is hanging on only by the grace of Jesus Christ. And if we turn from him any further, it's like, the string on the hem of the garment. If we turn from it any further, we are literally hanging by a thread and Jesus is the one holding the other end of it. And we need to turn back to Christ. Our children need to be taught that serving the Lord is the number one thing in life. Everything else is secondary. And we also need to start living that way, too, in America. Jesus Christ and serving him, honoring him, is number one. And so Jesus told several parables. One of them was the parable of the householder in Matthew 21, verse 33. He said, hear the parable. There was a certain householder. That's like a landlord, okay? Um, he planted a vineyard, he hedged around it, he digged the wine press, he built the tower, and he, he rented it out to farmers. Okay? Now, this is how a person builds wealth. This is how you do it, right here. The Bible teaches you how to do it. Now, your goal may not be to build wealth. I'm not preaching about building wealth, okay? Like, Jill, I know you know what I'm talking about. When you're a teacher, you're on a fixed income. All right, Crystal? You're on a fixed income. You don't get to fix it. The government fixes it for you. You know, I mean, then there's people that are trying to live on Social Security. How difficult is that? That's so awful, you know? pay your whole life, and then you try to live on a little tiny bit. Um, it's really messed up. So the point is not about, the point here is not wealth, okay? But there are some people that call, that God calls to build wealth to help fund his kingdom. That's a fact. And so this is, a, this is the Lord's teaching. He says, this is how you do it. You build up your business, you get it going, you get it producing, you put in all the components you need, now you lease that to somebody else, or you take a share of it as other people run it, you might still own it, all right? Then you go do it again, and then you go do it again, and then you go, you ever play Monopoly? Who wins? The ones with the most hotels and houses and, right? Okay? And so it's, it actually is a principle of the Bible, is if you want to build wealth, most banks nowadays, if you have 20% down, then you ha and you have really good credit, then you can buy a business if you can prove to that bank that it's a profitable business and the price is fair. Okay? You got your 20%, you put it down. You can't just, okay, I'm done. You got to make it succeed. You got to be there. You got to work. You got to get it going. Now you can turn it over to someone else to manage it and you go on to the... Now there's a point to this. Did anybody teach you this in school? Nobody taught this to me in school. I think we ought to be teaching stuff like this in school. 
life skills, how to build business. And then there's some that are going into a profession, and that profession has a set income. Some are set high, some are set low, some are set in. There is nothing wrong with that. The answer is do what the Lord has called you to do and leads you to do and be successful at it. So this man, he's, guess what he does? He entrusts, he entrusts people with what God has given him. And what did they do? Well, as soon as he left, they started messing around and not doing their job. And, oh, well, it's his money. It's not mine. Well, we're spending your money. Ha, ha, ha. I mean, this is how irresponsible, ungodly people do. A godly person that's responsible treats every responsibility they're given as if it was given to them by God. Now, this is training for where we are headed. We are headed to a time, may not be in our lifetime, it may be our kids and our grandkids, but we need to keep teaching it. It might be in our lifetime, we're headed for a time where God will give you responsibilities you never thought you would have, and if you're faithful over those few things, he will make you leader over many things. And it goes back to this story right here. And, you know, as employees, Jesus said we're supposed to serve our, our masters or our bosses. We're supposed to be good and honest and trustworthy, right? Like the Boy Scouts. We're supposed to be good citizens. And we're supposed to do what we're called to do and keep our responsibilities. He said when the time came, what did they do? He sent someone and they killed him. Verse 36. The husbandman took his servants and he beat one and killed another one, stoned another one. And he said to the servants, more than the first, all right, it said, but they did the same to him anyway. Now, here's what that is. That is God sending the flood. He said, the human race has messed up. I am going to send the flood and start all over. And he did, but what did they do? They did worse toward God than they did before. And then he sent his son, right? We can see the story, right? This is the parable that we're saved and we're given an opportunity by the son of the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ himself came to earth. We celebrated it this Christmas. It's an honor and a privilege to work for Jesus. Not something we should take lightly. God's pretty serious about it. If you'll turn over to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, the disciples asked Jesus two questions in <coughs> verse 3. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what will be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? So two questions. When will it be, and what will the signs be? And the basic answer, and this is no parable. This is a preparation for all of us. The basic answer is this. No man knows the day nor the hour when all this will happen. But I would not have you be ignorant of the signs. And he went into telling about several signs. And he told about the return of Israel to the return of the people of Israel to their land, which happened this century, by the way, or the last one, <coughs> excuse me, in the 40s. And uh, then he goes on and tells about that the people will turn from God and that there will be an anti-Christ movement and that eventually it will result in a leader that will become the most popular leader in the history of the world. And that person we call the Antichrist. So Jesus told that. And then he went on to talk about the second coming. And then he talked about 
uh, in chapter 25, the parable of the ten virgins. He said it's going to be at a time, the return of Christ is going to be at a time when half the people who think they're going to heaven really are not going to heaven. When five out of ten, that happened last week, didn't it? He says five out of ten are not going. He said ten people think they're going, but only five are going. Now, this is very important. We're at a time right now where only about half the population of the greatest Christian nation in the history of the world will believe in God anymore. Then he told another parable. That's the parable of the talents. That's down in verse 14, chapter 25. Like I said, I've never preached this way before, but God has just kind of shown me this big picture of all through this whole part of the Bible. He's saying, you better get ready. You better get ready, and you better start making serving Christ your number one priority in life. And here we are. It says, verse 14, the kingdom of heaven is like a man that traveled to a far country who called his own servants and delivered them his goods. All right, and to one he gave five talents, and to another he gave two, and then to another he gave one. Now this is another formula for how God says to do business. The first one is, to build a business, get it going well, turn it over to someone trustworthy, and then go do it again and again. This is a different approach. This is someone who's already got a lot of money to invest, like millions and millions of dollars to invest. I'm sure all of us do. And he says, take that and give it to this person, and his job is to invest your money and build the business and turn it over. You see what I mean? It's like another level higher, right? It's the financier. This is more like a bank. Like, okay? And we don't talk about this kind of stuff in church very much. And I think it's a mistake. I really think we should be talking more about this kind of stuff to our children as they're growing up and say, this is how God will help you become financially prosperous and then you can give to uh build the kingdom here on earth. What does it mean to build the kingdom here on earth? It really only has one answer. Win souls to Jesus Christ. That is building the kingdom. Sometimes it takes money to build a church for that purpose. It takes money to send missionaries for that purpose. It takes money to build uh, uh, orphans and widows homes and different things that we do to reach people for Christ. The whole point is to reach people for Christ. The whole point of everything is how many people are we going to help get to heaven? That's the whole point of everything we do. And so he says, now if, if the kingdom of God is like that too, he says the kingdom of God is like this. You're an apostle, and you are full of the richness of the spiritual gifts of God. God has saved you. He's forgiven you. You're a follower. You're a disciple of Christ. Now you can give that to someone else and teach them how to do what you've been doing. And so it's, it's both. He's, he's talking about a physical way of making money, and he's talking about a spiritual way of winning people to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to simplify it. I realize there's different ways to look at the kingdom of God. There's a, several different ways to look at it. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Jesus, right? And I've heard lots of detailed teaching on the differences, but I would propose to you that those are different ways to look at the same thing, that there's only one kingdom, the everlasting kingdom that will live forever with Jesus and his family. And it's the kingdom of God, it's the kingdom of heaven, it's the kingdom of Jesus. They have different aspects, but they actually all are one, just like the kingdom of just like the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 
There are three different aspects, but they're actually just one. There's only one kingdom that will go forever in eternity. That's the one that you and I are a part of, and we want others to be a part of it too. And so it's it, simplify it. That's what Jesus did with parables. He was trying to simplify it where it was easier to understand. He said, yeah, the wealthy man, he's got money. That's all he's got. You know, without the Lord, he has nothing. But if he's got the Lord, he's going to live forever. And so that is the most valuable treasure of all. Now he's going to train someone else to train someone else to train someone else. Have anybody ever done multi-level marketing? Come on, admit it. I've done it lots of times. I don't regret it. I kind of enjoyed it. In fact, that's how I met some of y'all years ago. Uh, everything really is multi-level marketing. Everything. Insurance, products. That's why, I mean, they're stuck on the shipping level right now out in the ocean. It's all about levels and commissions and sales, right? Okay. Well, this is what Jesus did. He recruited 12 disciples. And he taught them how to go recruit and f touch them and lay hands on them and fill them with the Spirit of God. And they're so on fire, they can't help but tell everybody about Jesus. And that the way I, that's the way I want to be in 2022. I want to be so fired up again that I just can't help but tell anybody gets close to me about Jesus. I think Mike Russell calls it the 10-foot rule. Anybody comes within 10 feet, you tell them about Jesus. So that's the way Jesus built his kingdom, is through reaching others who will reach others who will reach others. We used to sing a song of Falls Creek, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. Remember that? And Huh? Pass it on. Yeah, that was the name of the song. Pass it on. This is what it's all about. Jesus is using earthly uh, lessons that people can relate to. People understood how to make money. And he was saying, build the kingdom of God the same way. Build the kingdom of God the same way. And so the parable of the talents is in verse 14. He said, the kingdom of God is like the man traveling to a far country who called his own servants, delivered them into his goods or his money, and to one he gave five talents. Anybody know what a talent is? <coughs> Excuse me. Susie and I got sick last Sunday night, and we were sick for about four days. We're not sick anymore. We just have a lingering cough. And so uh, it's not going to linger much longer in Jesus' name. A talent of silver. Okay, well, let's read on. The, my, my translation here says um, that one talent of silver is about 380 thousand dollars one talent it's not singing it's not speaking it's not I mean he's calling it a talent because that was what they called that much silver I mean I think you can apply it to your talents I think you can apply it to your talents if you don't use your talents for the Lord you lose it I mean, I've seen it happen over and over and over. People who could sing like a bird, and they just didn't want to do it anymore. Pretty soon they couldn't. And uh, people that could play, and they just quit, and now they can't play. I mean, if God gave you a talent, use it for him, and it'll get bigger and better all the time. But the bottom line is he's actually talking about money. He says, if the Lord has given you X, your job is to be responsible with it, Build it, not lose it, not gamble it, not go to the casino and lose everything, not gamble on the stock market and lose everything. Not, I mean, I could name a lot of examples, and I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes, but the fact of the matter is Americans are really bad about just totally wasting what God gives them. How many times have you known somebody? They won a big payout, and it was gone in a week. I mean, it's just the way human nature is. I'm not putting anybody down. I'm saying, can he trust you with what he gives you? Yes or no? And if he can, 
He's going to use you to win a lot of people to Jesus. Can anybody name Billy Graham's mother? Can anybody name George Washington's mother? Can anybody name... Uh, I can't even name the person, much less the mother. How many would agree with me that if George, Mo George Washington's mother had not raised him right, we wouldn't be here today where we are? Would you agree that if Billy Graham's mother had not raised him right, millions and millions and millions and millions of people would be headed for hell instead of heaven? And we're just talking about two people. That's how big a difference you can make. Even if you don't have a penny. Even if you don't have any money to build a building. or You've got what God gave you. And he wants you to use it to lead people to Jesus. Everything we do here at this church is about leading people to Jesus. I know I'm out of time. But I've got to close with one last scripture which is in my Bible, it's circled and stars and underlined and because I hope for it so much, not because I have earned it. None of us have done anything. Jesus has done it all. But we have to be willing to let him do it through us, right? I mean, is there anything worse than a clogged up sewer pipe? It messes up your whole house. You sure don't want to have to fix it. Well, that's how it is when we don't let the Lord flow through us. We're just a clogged up sewer pipe. But when you let the Lord flow through you, you can give the water of life to more people than you ever dreamed. And so he says in verse 21... The Lord will say to his good servant, Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over these few things, and I'm going to make you a leader over many. That means I'm going to give you more responsibility because I know I can trust you. Isn't that awesome to think? Isn't it awesome to think Jesus can trust me? Jesus can trust me. Isn't that great? Let's pray. Would you stand with me?